Hi everyone, I am Dr. Vicky. I'm the Maternal Medicine Fellow in Hospital Team for Aziza Kuala Lumpur. Today, I'll be talking about Antiphospholipid Syndrome in Pregnancy. I believe many of us have heard this syndrome multiple times. Well, we have been managing many of the complications of this uh, Antiphospholipid Syndrome in Pregnancy. Therefore, it is very important for us to know how to diagnose when to screen it rather than to treat the complications arising from this syndrome. Let me walk you through the outline of my talk today. First, we'll be talking about pathophysiology of antiphospholipid syndrome. I believe pathophysiology is important for us to understand the disorder before we can treat the syndrome in pregnancy. Then we will discuss about the diagnostic criteria as per recommended by the panel of experts. When do we screen for ATS and how do we screen it? And I'll be presenting a couple of cases for us to discuss the evidence-based management of ATS in pregnancy. Lastly, I will be ending my presentation with some take-home messages. Antiphospholipid syndrome is also known as the Hughes syndrome. It is a clinical autoimmune syndrome characterized by venous or arterial thrombosis and or pregnancy morbidity in the presence of persistent laboratory evidence of antiphospholipid antibodies. Now, it can be classified into thrombotic APS, where venous, arterial, or microvascular thrombosis take place. It can also be obstetric APS, which is characterized by antiphospholipid syndrome-related pregnancy morbidity, namely fetal loss after the 10th week of pregnancy, placental insufficiency, and recurrent early pregnancy losses. Next, we have catastrophic APS. This is characterized by widespread intravascular thrombosis, leading to multiple organ failure. This is an emergency. Therefore, it is important to know what are the possible triggers for catastrophic APS. They include infection, stress such as surgery or trauma, malignancy, withdrawal of anticoagulant, pregnancy, or initiation of combined hormonal therapy, and of course, when there is a flare of any autoimmune disease. Let's discuss about pathophysiology of antiphospholipid syndrome. This cartoon clearly uh, gives us a nice picture of how pathophysiology of antiphospholipid syndrome occur. We know that patients with APS has antiphospholipid antibodies produced by their B cells. And these antiphospholipid antibodies target the plasma protein, which is beta-2 glycoprotein 1 presence on the endothelial cells. With the binding of antiphospholipid antibodies to this beta-2 glycoprotein 1, it activates the inflammatory cells and endothelial cells to release E-selectin, increase tissue factor, release vascular endothelial growth factor, and increase complement activity. This binding also promotes coagulation by increasing expression of glycoprotein 2B3A. Therefore, platelet plays a major role in promotion of coagulation in pathophysiology of antiphospholipid syndrome. It also reduces tissue factor pathway inhibitor activity. It reduces fibrinolysis and protein C activity. When it comes to pregnancy, it interferes with trophoblast and deciduous cells by reduced proliferation and syncytial formation, increased complement activity, reduced human coronic gonadotropin and increased trophoblast apoptosis. This cascade of mechanism leads to inflammation, vasculopathy, thrombosis, and pregnancy complication. Now, it is important to know what is the diagnostic criteria before we diagnosed someone with antiphospholipid syndrome. It all started in 1999 
when the Sapporo criteria was proposed by a panel of experts for the diagnosis of antiphospholipid syndrome. Seven years later, in 2006, there was a revised Sapporo criteria, which is also named the Sydney criteria. In this very same year, the international consensus statement on an update of classification criteria for definite antiphospholipid syndrome was published. And in this journal, they define antiphospholipid syndrome as someone with one clinical criteria plus one laboratory criteria. And the clinical criteria include vascular thrombosis, be it arterial or venous, or any pregnancy morbidity, which includes one or more fetal, one or more death of a normal fetus at more than 10 weeks, that is with all other causes being excluded, one or more premature birth at less than 34 weeks due to severe preeclampsia or placental insufficiency, and more than three consecutive proportion at less than 10 weeks with other causes being ruled out. The laboratory criteria include anti-cardiolipin antibody, which can be IgG or IgM, the lupus anticoagulant, and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibody can be IgG and IgM. But for a patient to fulfill the laboratory criteria, it is important that this antibody is of medium to high titer, namely at 40 and above or higher than 99th centile, and they have to be persistently positive at least 12 weeks apart. That means a patient has to have at least two positive tests 12 weeks apart for them to fulfill the laboratory criteria. Now we know that there are certain clinical manifestations being listed in the revised support criteria, but there are also many other major clinical manifestations which may suggest antiphospholipid syndrome, but are not listed or not included in the revised Sapporo classification criteria. The panel of experts listed them as the non-criteria clinical manifestation of APS. And this clinical manifestation include hematologically thrombocytopenia. Most commonly, patients with APS will have mild thrombocytopenia. Therefore, if you have a patient with severe thrombocytopenia, perhaps it is worth it to further investigate to rule out other causes first. Next is hemolytic anemia. And in the kidney, there can be acute thrombotic microangiopathy or chronic vessel occlusive lesion. In the heart, there can be valve, vegetations, or thickening. On the skin, bivado reticularis or lipidoid vasculopathy. And neurologically, the patient can present with cognitive dysfunction or subcortical white matter changes. It is important to know about screening for APS. We know that the revised Sapporo criteria for classification has a strict criteria to diagnose APS. However, the panel of experts thinks that this criteria should only be used as a guide and not a rigid formula. The diagnosis should still be considered in patients with persistent, moderate to high-risk antiphospholipid antibody profiles and in patients with any antiphospholipid antibody-related finding, although they do not strictly fulfill the rigid formula of the revised Sapporo criteria classification. What are the indications for screening? We, the obstetricians, most of the time screen patients for ABS due to their obstetric history. As we discussed earlier, the obstetric criteria for APS in pregnancy. Other patients which also require screening include those with history of SLE or other autoimmune disorder. We have to know that about 30% of patients with SLE and other autoimmune disorder actually has antiphospholipid antibody. When you, when you have a patient with levado reticularis, it is also worth screening for APS. A patient with prolonged baseline APTT, of course, someone with recurrent thrombosis, VTE at unusual sites, someone with a history of arterial thrombosis without a clear risk factor, someone with thrombocytopenia, mainly those with mild thrombocytopenia, 
and a patient with cardiac valve abnormalities in the, in the absence of other explanations. Now, we, the obstetricians, often send placenta for histopathological examination, especially in cases when we have, um, when we suspect placental insufficiency or when we have an intrauterine death. But what are we looking for? Have you ever wondered about that? The placental features which, is, which are suggestive of antiphospholipid syndrome includes subchoronic thrombosis, subamniotic hematoma, fetal thrombotic vasculopathy, maternal floor infarct, retroplacental hematoma, marginal hematoma, and significant perivillous fibrinoid deposition. So when you have these features in your placental HPE, always remember to screen for antiphospholipid syndrome. When it comes to screening, it is important to understand the basic principle of screening. We know that antiphospholipid antibodies are not only a diagnostic marker for APS, it is also a risk factor for thrombotic and obstetric complications. However, thrombosis events occur in multifactorial risk factor, right? So therefore, it is important to take into consideration as well to screen for other non-APL thrombotic risk factor, such as age, hypertension, smoking, hyperlipidemia, patient with obesity, and also underlying renal disease. Now, in the international consensus statement, it is written that physicians should not classify APS in patients with more than five years interval of their clinical event and positive laboratory test. Not every positive APL test is clinically significant. When we are performing an LA test, it is important to remember three points. Number one, lupus anticoagulant test correlates better with clinical events than the anticardiolipin antibody and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibody. Number two, a false positive LA result may occur in patients who are on warfarin, heparin, or direct oral anticoagulants. Therefore, it is very important to document in the request form that patient is in is on anticoagulant therapy, is on anticoagulant therapy when we request for LA test. In fact, for patients with INR more than 3.5, it is not recommended to perform the LA test as these test results will be invalid. Number three, transient APL positivity is common during infection. Therefore, it is important to obtain a thorough clinical history when we order for the test. And it's also the reason why to diagnose APS, we have to have persistent positivity rather than transient positivity. How do we perform LA tests? Have you wonder? Now, LA testing is performed in three steps. Number one, screening. During screening, the specimen is uh, checked to see whether um, the phospholipid dependent clotting time is prolonged or not. For this screening test, we use either the APTT base assay or the DRVBT test. This is the activated partial thromboplastin time base assay or the diluted Brussels viper venom test. If this test is positive, we move on to the next step, which is the mixing test. During the mixing test, a control specimen from normal pool plasma would be added in one-to-one -one ratio into the specimen of your patient. And then they will check again for the prolongation. If the prolongation is fully corrected, then the presence of lupus anticoagulant is ruled out. And we therefore need to consider clotting factor deficiency. However, if the mixing test is not, uh, does not fully correct the prolongation, then we proceed to the final step, which is the confirmatory test. In this confirmatory test, the phospholipid agent would be added to the specimen to see whether the prolongation shortens significantly or not. If it does, 
then lupus anticoagulant is converted. Now, when we are screening for lupus anticoagulant, it is also important to remember, although LA correlates best with thrombosis and obstetric events, the interlaboratory concordance is very poor. This is mainly due to many labs using different LA assays, which is available in the market. They can be APTT based or DRBDT, and different labs can have their own cutoff for the positivity of the LA test. All right. Um, one positive test is suffice to confirm positivity. However, if you have a negative test, it is recommended strongly that two or more LA tests with different assay principle should be performed prior to excluding the presence of lupus anticoagulant. Therefore, I think it is important when you have a patient which, clinic, which clinically is really suggestive of antiphospholipid syndrome, however, her ABS screening is negative, perhaps you should send the specimen to another laboratory using a different assay principle to check whether is this really a negative antiphospholipid screening. Now, let me walk you through a few clinical weaknesses for us to discuss about the evidence-based management of APS in pregnancy. Now, during the discussion of these cases, I will be mainly based on two clinical guidelines, which is the EULA recommendation and also the ACR recommendation, because these two are the most important guidelines and they are based on evidence. Let's start with our first case. This is a 35-year-old primary gravida at 12 weeks. She's a known case of SLE and was found to have lupus anticoagulant positive. A scan shows that this is a viable intrauterine pregnancy. Now, this is a patient with APL positivity, but without APS. What does the guideline recommend? The EULA guideline recommends for patients with high-risk APL profile but no history of thrombosis or pregnancy complication, whether they have SLE or not, treatment with low-dose aspirin of 75 to 100 mg daily during pregnancy should be considered. This guideline is based on some um, experts' opinion because um, Although some randomized control trial and some low quality studies suggest that there is no difference in the prevalence of live birth with the use of low dose aspirin, experts still think that it is important to put patients on low dose aspirin as these are the patients at, with increased risk of thrombotic and obstetric uh, complications. What, is, what does the American College of Rheumatology recommend? They recommend for patients with SLE, we should continue hydroxychloroquine if they are already on. If they are not on, we should start them on hydroxychloroquine. They also agree with the use of low-dose aspirin. Now, APL positivity without APS, just low-dose aspirin will do. Our second case. This is a 31-year-old G4 para 1 at 7 weeks. She has stable SLE with lupus nephritis. Her ANA, DSDNA, NTRO, and TILA are all positive. Her APS screening shows LA positive, but her ACL and anti-beta-glycoprotein 1 is negative. She had two previous history of second trimester loss at 18 and 20 weeks, respectively. And she also had a history of early neonatal death in the third pregnancy at 29 weeks with a birth weight of just 600 grams. On scan, this is a viable intrauterine pregnancy. This is obstetric APS. And what does the guideline recommend for patient with obstetric APS? The EULA guideline recommends for patient with obstetric APS only without prior thrombotic event, whether with or without SLD, a combination treatment with low-dose aspirin and heparin at prophylactic dosage during pregnancy is recommended. This is based on some data from a randomized control trial showing that for women with a history of fetal loss, 
combination treatment with low-dose aspirin and prophylactic heparin was associated with a higher likelihood of live birth compared with treatment with low-dose aspirin alone. The American College of Rheumatology um, suggested for patients with SLE continue hydroxychloroquine. If they have anti-row anti la positive, we should perform zero fetal echo from 16 to 26 weeks. And for patients with obstetric APS, we should be on low-dose aspirin with prophylactic heparin until 6 to 12 weeks postpartum. Let's move on to our third case. This is a 29-year-old primary gravida at 10 weeks. She had a history of ischemic stroke a year ago. Her BMI is 25, she's not a smoker, and she has got no other medical problem before that. Her ANA is negative. Echo and carotid artery doppler are normal as well, but her APS shows positive APL antibodies. This is definitely a thrombotic APS. The EULA guideline recommends for patients with history of thrombotic APS, combination treatment with low-dose aspirin and heparin at therapeutic dosage during pregnancy is recommended. Now, this is based on observational study when they showed treatment with low-dose aspirin and therapeutic dose heparin was associated with live birth in 79% of pregnancies on average. And because the history of thrombotic APS is associated with increased risk of future thrombosis or obstetric event, treatment with low-dose aspirin and heparin at therapeutic dosage in pregnancy is recommended. The American College of Rheumatology also agreed that patients with thrombotic APS should be started on low-dose aspirin and therapeutic heparin. This is my final case. It is a 34-year-old lady. She's 7 para 0 plus 6 at 8 weeks. She's not a smoker. Her BMI is 22. All her previous pregnancies ended at 6 to 8 weeks. She was diagnosed as primary APS when her LA and ACL were both positive. Her NA is negative. This Pregnancy, a scan shows of a viable intrauterine pregnancy. Now, because of obstetric APS, she was started on low-dose aspirin and prophylactic dose heparin. Now, let's see what happened next. At 24 weeks, she was admitted for severe preeclampsia and HELP syndrome. And the pregnancy unfortunately ended with an intrauterine death. This is a refractory APS. This is an antiphospholipid syndrome which does not respond to initial treatment. Can we do better? Now, refractory obstetric APS. For Euler recommendation, they recommend in women with criteria obstetric APS with recurrent pregnancy complications despite combination treatment with low dose aspirin and heparin at prophylactic dose an increased dose of heparin to therapeutic dose or addition of hydroxychloroquine or low-dose prednisolone in the first trimester may be considered. The use, of, the use of intravenous immunoglobulin might also be considered in highly selected cases. What does the American College of Rheumatology um, recommend? They think that this is still obstetric APS. And therefore, they still stick to their recommendation of low-dose aspirin with prophylactic heparin until 6 to 12 weeks. Yes, maybe we can add on hydroxychloroquine, but they conditionally recommend against therapeutic dose heparin or IVIG, and they are strongly against the recommendation of prednisolone. Let's look at what does the evidence say. Now, this is a paper published um, looking into first trimester low-dose prednisolone in refractory antiphospholipid antibody-related pregnancy loss. And the authors found that um, before low-dose prednisolone was given, only 4% pregnancies ended with a live birth. Whereas after the low-dose prednisolone was initiated, there was 61% live birth. The authors concluded that in view of no significant fetal or maternal morbidity, the addition of first trimester low-dose prednisolone to conventional treatment is worth of 
further assessment in the management of refractory antiphospholipid antibody related pregnancy loss. What about the addition of hydroxychloroquine? Now, this is a paper looking into the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine for obstetric outcome in antiphospholipid syndrome. It is based on data from a European multi center retrospective study. The authors from here concluded that comparing the outcome of pregnancies treated by addition of hydroxychloroquine to previous pregnancies under the conventional treatment, pregnancy losses decreased from 81 to 19%. So authors think that their study shows benefit of hydroxychloroquine addition in patients with refractory obstetric APS, and they think that there is a need for more prospective studies to confirm this study. Now, during um, when we looked into the EULA recommendation for management of antiphospholipid syndrome in um, adults, which includes pregnant ladies, it is stressed, um, it is um, stated that we should uh, define patients' antiphospholipid antibody um, based on their APL profile. So these APL antibodies can be classified into medium high-risk titer, high-risk APL profile, and low-risk APL profile. Now, we know that, as we mentioned earlier, we know that medium-high APL titer means when uh, the anticardiolipin antibody and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein antibody is above 40 or 99th centile based on the ELISA test. Now, what is high-risk APL profile? High-risk high risk APL profile means there is presence of lupus anticoagulant or when there is double or triple antiphospholipid antibody or when there is persistently high APL titus. A low-risk APL profile is isolated anticardiolipin antibody or anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibody, either one in medium titus or when there is just transient positivity of antiphospholipid antibodies. Now, why is this APL profile so important? Now, this is the American Journal of Obstetric and Gynecology, where they, there is a paper published in the ACE JOG in 2017, looking into antiphospholipid antibody profile based obstetric outcomes of primary antiphospholipid syndrome. This is the pregnant study. The authors concluded that women with primary antiphospholipid syndrome have increased risk of obstetric complications and lower live birth rate when there is more than one antiphospholipid antibody. And despite therapy with low-dose aspirin and prophylactic low molecular weight heparin, the chance of live birth is only 30% for triple positive women. Now talking about triple positivity, there is another study looking into triple antiphospholipid antibody positivity associated with pregnancy complication. And the conclusion from this study is combination treatment with low-dose aspirin and low-molecular weight heparin did not always prevent adverse pregnancy outcome, especially in patients with triple antiphospholipid antibody positivity. And these are the patients who deserve additional therapeutic strategies during pregnancy. Again, refractory obstetric antiphospholipid syndrome and um, their features, treatment, and outcome. And in this study, they concluded that the main features for refractory obstetric APS were the high rates of lupus anticoagulant and triple APL positivity. So we can see from here that high, uh, high risk APL profile, namely high, high rates of lupus anticoagulant and triple APL positivity they are the most important risk factor for uh, refractory obstetric APS and also the APS, meaning APS, which does not respond to our routine treatment. And the uh, authors for this paper actually concluded that steroids could be effective in this APS profile, but prospective studies are necessary. Now, let me summarize. Uh, my, the management um, recommended in EULA guideline and ACR into one slide. 
This is the management based on risk stratification. When we have a low risk patient, namely patient with just APL positive without the syndrome itself, low dose aspirin is usually adequate. A patient with medium risk, namely obstetric APS, low dose aspirin and prophylactic dose low molecular weight heparin should be recommended. High risk patients such as those with thrombotic APS should have low dose aspirin and therapeutic dose low molecular weight heparin on board. And those with very high risk, namely triple APL positivity and obstetric or thrombotic APS or refractory APS should have low dose aspirin, therapeutic dose low molecular weight heparin, maybe hydroxychloroquine, maybe with the addition of low dose prednisolone in the first trimester. Now, I would like to end my presentation with some take home messages. Number one, it is important for us to identify risk factors and screen adequately. It is only with screening that we will be able to diagnose antiphospholipid syndrome. And only when we diagnose the syndrome, we'll be able to provide treatment to improve the care of these pregnant patients. Number two, treatment should always be customized individually. We should always treat the patient and not the investigation results. Not all patients behave similarly with one treatment. Always, uh, always um, uh, customize your treatment based on individual needs. Next, if you have failed a therapy, do not give up. Think again. Maybe we missed something, or maybe we should escalate the therapy further. These are my references, and with that, I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. Thank you.